Good evening and welcome to Conrad Grable University College and to the 2013 School for Ministers. This is the public presentation part with Gordon Mattis, and this event is sponsored by Mennonite Church Eastern Canada. I am Susan Schultz Huxman, president of Conrad Grable, and on behalf of all our faculty and staff, I do wish you a warm welcome, even though it is very, very cold outside. I was thinking as I was coming down here, the last CMU professor that we had here just two weeks ago was snowed out. Uh, Gerald Gerbrandt was our visiting scholar for the uh, Rod and Lorna Sawatsky lecture series, and uh, we were saved by technology. I don't often use that expression, saved by technology, but we were that night because even though the University of Waterloo shut down, Gerald was here, and uh, through Akeem Isaac's help and Fred Martin's, we actually streamed the video, and it's up on our website, and if you'd like to see uh, Gerald's presentation, you can go to grable.ca uh, and see that uh, presentation. We are glad that you are here in person tonight, even though we are recording this presentation for our website, too. We have been delighted to host the MCEC School for Ministers these past three days at Grable. We are in our 36th year of partnering with MCEC. The School for Ministers program began under Ralph Liebold's presidency in the mid-1970s. So thank you, Ralph. I don't know if he is here. He was here earlier this morning and was here yesterday, and Ralph told me that in the 36 years of the program, he only missed twice. Maybe he missed tonight, so it's three times. That he only missed twice, once he was on sabbatical and, and once for ill health. Uh, but it's been a wonderful partnership that we have had over the years. We very much value uh, our church affiliation with MCEC. It is at the heart of our mission at Conrad Grable to seek wisdom, to nurture faith and to pursue peace in service to church and society, and it is at the heart of MCEC's mission to extend the peace of Jesus Christ and to develop leaders for the church. So, about tonight's speaker. Area pastors have learned much about the book of Joshua this week from Gordon. It is, as he says, the most obnoxious of texts, a truly bitter text, for sure a problem text for Mennonites in its heralding of divine violence. We've also learned from Gordon how to wrestle with Joshua, to engage this loathsome book as a dialogue partner. We have learned how to transpose a text in travail to a new key and other insightful and provocative metaphors. So what about the book of Gordon? Who is this guy? Some of you know him, others do not. Dr. Gordon Matties is professor of biblical and theological studies at Canadian Mennonite University in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He has been teaching in Winnipeg since 1984. Most recently, he has served as Dean of Humanities and Sciences at CMU. He is the author of many books and articles and has special expertise in the Old Testament. His most recently scholarly contribution is the book, Joshua, as part of the Believer's Church Bible Criticism Series, and it is back here on the table and available for purchase uh, after the presentation, his most recent publication of 2012. Gordon grew up in Abbotsford, British Columbia. He studied at Firecrest Bible Institute, the University of British Columbia, Regent College in Vancouver, and for his master's and PhD degree, he earned those at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Gordon and his wife, Lori, who is with us uh, this evening as well, have two children, and the family attends River East Mennonite Brethren Church. At CMU, Gordon also directs the Seeing is Believing film series and is director of Film and Faith. He has an interesting blog on movies as spiritual discipline 
and an extensive, very rich online bibliography on religion and film. Gordon also leads study tours every other year to the Holy At Land. Uh, next year will mark his seventh year of leading such a tour. In his spare time, Gordon likes windsurfing and traveling. Tonight, Professor Baddies will be speaking on What About Joshua? Full of violence and conquest, he writes, Joshua is perhaps the most troublesome, even offensive book in the Bible. It has been used to support war, conquest, and even genocide. And for these reasons and more, Gordon argues, Joshua may well be the book for our time. Please help me to welcome Dr. Gordon Maddies. during the daytime yesterday and today that I would show a clip from Veggie Tales tonight. And that was my attempt to my ploy to get them to come tonight. Because <laughs> I knew they probably knew that they would get some, you know, repetition tonight and they might leave tonight saying, oh I heard that already, so I should have stayed home. But the Veggie Tales is going to be new tonight, and a couple of other things too. Very pleased to be here, honored to be invited to give this presentation. As I told someone earlier, this is a, partly a kind of academic lecture and also partly a, an attempt to, to um, confess some things about what I'm committed to and about what I struggle with. And so um, it'll be a bit of both. Now isn't it true that whenever you get into a conversation about war and peace in the Bible, especially if you're trying to present or to defend a biblical peace theology, someone will invariably ask, but what about Joshua? I'm so pleased with this title because I didn't make it up. Uh, and I, after I discovered the title, I said, that really works. Because everybody asks, well, what about Joshua? Well, I would ask back, well, what about, you know, Genesis? Or what about Exodus? Or what about, you can pick practically any biblical book and say, well, what about it? Because every biblical book has a host of questions around it, except for Ephesians. <laughs> Tom, you order yourself. <laughs> so you might pick a smattering of other biblical books and passages to fill out the list of offending texts, arriving finally at the book of Revelation, uh, in which a lot of people get bloodied and killed, and horses are trampling through mud with blood up to their knees. It doesn't end. From beginning to the end, the Bible is a text full of violence. But of all the texts in the Bible, the Canaanite genocide mandated by Deuteronomy and reported as having been carried out in the book of Joshua seems to be the straw that really breaks the camel's back. Canaanite genocide has been a topic of concern ever since the earliest theologians of the church, I mean in the church, ever since the earliest theologians have wrestled with it in the second century. But you could go even further back, and this is going to be one of my points. The New Testament writers themselves wrestled with it. The Old Testament writers themselves wrestled with it. And so do we. The most graphic description of our larger theological problem with the Bible, at least as it's been posed from one side of the discussion, uh, comes from a kind of a strange little clip. Well, it's in his book, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, God is Not Good. Uh, but I have a clip here 
that puts it kind of nicely. Um, in which he characterizes God as a lot of people think about how the biblical God is portrayed in the Bible. It's not law. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. <laughs> Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> recent commentary on the book of Joshua, Stephen Williams writes this, the God of Joshua not only sanctions war, he orders it. He not only orders war, he leads it. He not only leads it, he commands total extermination. He abhors mercy. We may conclude that the fact that the battle belongs to the Lord breeds a perverted form of humility, but it does not exactly breed the peacemaker. The whole business, to put it mildly, is not nauseatingly repulsive, and nausea is nothing compared to what the alleged victims of Yahweh must have suffered. He continues, is God actually capable of commanding anything morally abhorrent? Could God actually have commanded anything like what he supposedly commanded in these accounts? Is such a representation anything but a religious monstrosity? And he says at the end of his book, if there indeed exists such a God as the book of Joshua conveys to us, and if such a God is capable of commanding what the book of Joshua says that he commands, we are all in trouble. We're all even more in trouble if we take the approach of Eugene Merrill, who writes this in the book, Show Them No Mercy, God and Canaanite Genocide. If God is all that the Bible says he is, all that he does must be good. And that includes authorization of genocide. All that he does must be good, and that includes authorization of genocide. And that's from a book called, subtitled, Four Views on God and Canaanite Genocide. There's something wrong here if it comes down to four views, kind of like a rook game. One color is trump, and if you play your cards, especially the trump card the right way, uh, and you're the one who gets to call the trump color, you win the game. But, you know, if you're good enough at it. I can't do that, even if I call the trump card. But I know that good players who know how to do that, they win. Now, I don't claim today to have a trump card. And I don't want to let that analogy get in the way. I'm actually quite uncomfortable with it. And I'll tell you why in just a while. Now, there is an easy way to solve this problem. Let's pick and choose biblical texts that we're happy with. And uh, we all do that. I've got a lot of underlinings in my Bible of verses that, that I like. I can show them to you. It's all underlined everywhere. But only the verses I like. I was surprised to find a few weeks ago uh, in the basement of our congregation's building uh, in the Sunday School area, big banner with Joshua 1 verse 9 on it. 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I don't know what they were teaching in the children's Sunday school, but I like that verse. And children do need to know that the Lord is with them wherever they go. And to be strong and courageous because the Lord is with them wherever they go. So we've all got these favorite verses. I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall be successful. Here's the one, be strong and courageous. For this one, choose this day whom you will serve. Just uh, two weekends ago, I was visiting my family in British Columbia, and I walked into my sister's home. We had a sibling gathering, turkey dinner, and uh, I noticed that she had this verse on a plaque in her front entrance, just the last part. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I used to, I used to see a lot more of those kinds of plaques in homes, but it's not likely I would have, uh, and by the way, that's fine. I, I don't mind that kind of thing. But it's very unlikely that we would find this plaque, which is how many verses uh, later? Now, I, I, this is a typo. Uh, it's not 24:15. It's 24:19. 24:19. Four verses later, Joshua says, "You cannot serve the Lord." Now, why would I put that up as a plaque in my house? Maybe to remind me of my frailty. In any case, I have three Bibles on my bookshelf in my office. One is called the Freedom Bible. Another is called the Poverty and Justice Bible. And a third one is the Green Bible. And do you know what characterizes each of those? They are color-coded. So when you open them up, the Poverty and Justice Bible has all the verses in the whole Bible colored. I think it's red or orange uh, that highlight that, those things. The um, Freedom Bible does the same. And by the way, who sponsors the Freedom Bible? The Salvation Army. That's perfect. Because they work a lot with people with addictions. And what you need from the Bible, you need to know that you are free, you are liberated from those things that you've been enslaved to. So what better way of helping people find what they need in the Bible by highlighting, uh, producing a book that, that uh, is called the Freedom Bible. Um, I haven't ordered this one yet, but I have it on my wish list on Amazon.ca. It's called the American Patriots Bible. Believe me, it's a real Bible. And this is what the description reads. I've actually seen it in real life. Quote, the one Bible that shows how a light from above shaped our nation. Never has a version of the Bible targeted the spiritual needs of those who love our country more than the American Patriots Bible. This extremely unique Bible shows how the history of the United States <coughs> connects the people and events of the Bible to our lives in the modern world. The story of the United States is wonderfully woven into the teachings of the Bible. <laughs> now each of the three Bibles I have on my bookshelf with highlighted passages in color uh, are good and helpful. So that when I'm teaching my course on creation, environment, and the Bible, I take out the Green Bible. When I'm teaching my course on biblical perspectives on peace and justice, I take it. Oh, wait a minute. I do. I take out the um, Poverty and Justice Bible. But what if we were to propose that we publish another one called the Violence and Peace Bible? 
And what we would do is we would highlight all the violence texts in one color and all the peace texts in another color. And you can easily see how, all of the, how these two themes echo throughout the whole of the Bible. And, and this would make everything quite clear. The problem will be apparent immediately. One cannot simply count or color code texts to determine which of the two stands out, violence or peace, and see, or put them on a scale and see which one is heavier. The fact is that over a thousand passages associate God with one kind of violence or another, including many in which God gives the command to kill people. But, like the American Patriots Bible, we're all prone to pick and choose. No matter where that is more viscerally, uh, uh, no, uh, sorry, in no place is that more viscerally connected than the book of Joshua. The problem I'm highlighting with these examples far too simplistically is an illustration of a larger problem that we wrestle with as we read scripture. How do we explain the violence in the Bible, in particular, divinely sanctioned violence? How we do that impinges on how we articulate a biblical theology and how we appeal to scripture in our characterization of God. Well, we have to deal with texts, texts like Deuteronomy 7, in which God gives the command through Moses, you must, verse 2, utterly destroy them, namely the seven nations of the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, etc. Verse 2, make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. Or Deuteronomy 20, verse 16 to 18, you shall annihilate them. Verse 16, you must not let anything that breathes remain alive. You shall annihilate them. The Hebrew word is cherem. And then you have the list of nations or peoples just as the Lord your God has commanded so that they may not teach you to do all the abhorrent things that they do for their gods. Joshua 6, verse 17, the city that is Jericho and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. There again the word heaven. And I point that out because I want to, it'll come back in a few minutes. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers we sent. And so in chapter 6, verse 21, then they devoted to destruction, that's the same word, heaven, by the edge of the sword, all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. Polish scholar Raphael Lemkin coined the term genocide in 1944. It was first applied during the Nuremberg, uh, the Nuremberg military tribunals. And in 1948, the uh, UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide uh, laid this out. According to the UN Convention, genocide is a crime under international law. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. And then they list such as killing members of the group, causing bodily mental harm to members of the group, um, and so on. Gregory Stanton says that genocide has its roots in the universal tendency of societies to classify other people as objects creating an us and a them, rooted in the propensity to dehumanize, which is the seedbed of genocide. And knowing a little bit about the history of World War II and Nazism, uh, you, you probably know how that kind of thing develops. With the cartoons, I could have shown some cartoons, but how Jews are uh, dehumanized, <coughs> Um, and we've probably all seen those kinds of things. Of course, putting Deuteronomy and Joshua into conversation with the United Nations resolution uh, on genocide uh, forces the issue. Some say that doing so brings a very modern sensitivity to the issue, and it skews the conversation in such a way that supports Richard Dawkins' side 
of the discussion. The Bible is a vile book, period. Well, what to do? Solutions abound. The easiest way is to rewrite the story as never having happened. Contemporary scholars have re-scripted the narrative of Joshua in various ways. I'll give you four. Three, scholarly, and one, vegetative. <laughs> one, based on archaeological evidence, the conquest likely didn't happen, as it's purported to have happened in the book of Joshua. Or it was not as extensive or thorough as we think it might have been. Any recent commentary, mine included, will spell out why it makes sense to suggest this solution. There is no archaeological evidence for the destruction of some of the towns that Joshua claims were destroyed. And therefore the conquest as it's described in the book of Joshua couldn't possibly have happened as it's described in the book of Joshua. Some people take that position to the extreme and say, the whole book of Joshua is essentially a fiction. A second approach is to say that the total eradication of the Canaanites didn't really happen because it's a mythic or a symbolic feature of biblical faith. The extermination of the Canaanites is metaphorical and it represents a rejection of all aspects of life that draw us away from total allegiance to God. I believe that that conclusion is correct. That is, the Bible teaches that anything that draws us away from total allegiance to God is idolatry. And I believe that that's what the book of Joshua teaches. But I don't think it's a mythic or a symbolic feature of biblical faith. I think they really did kill people. And I think they really did kill people in the name of God. Third, some claim that the book of Joshua is a fiction written by King Josiah's scribes in the 7th century BC as a propaganda vehicle for his violent reform which sought to eradicate religious diversity in Israel in the north. So Josiah was a king in Judah, and he had a window of opportunity during which the Assyrian yoke was slightly loosened, and so he took the opportunity and moved northward, destroyed the high places and shrines in the north, and used the book of Joshua, uh, and Deuteronomy for that matter, uh, as a justification for expanding his power base and his imperial grasp of the territory that ought to be rightfully his anyway. Why? Because God promised all of this to David. And Josiah belongs to that one uh, in Judah. But it's basically a fiction created by Josiah's scribes. So those three scholarly approaches tend to vie for uh, will vie with each other and, and uh, not put all three of them together and you can basically dismiss the book of Joshua out of hand. Well, um, in fact, every one of them has a little bit of truth to it, probably. But uh, this one is probably the most... Uh, here you go, folks. This is probably the most... Um, egregious example. As they march and nothing could stop them. On the seventh day, just like God had told them, they marched around Jericho seven times while the priests blew their horns. And just like God said, when they finished marching, the priests blew one horn
Textectomy, that's Eugene Peterson's term. Uh, cutting out of what the story says is that they killed all of the men, women, and children and animals. We find just two soldiers running off into the distance. Now, even if uh, those three academic uh, excuses are valid explanations, we're still left with the text. As Phil Jenkins puts it in his law, uh, his, uh, nice book, uh, Laying Down the Sword. Uh, quote, one way or another, believers skillfully avoid having to confront bloody texts. They learn to forget. The difficulty is, of course, that these texts still exist and still form part of canonized scripture. But, lucky for us, through time, we have devised all kinds of uh, useful strategies for interpreting the book of Joshua, which help us to come to terms. So. For example, one, an allegorical approach, uh, in which, for example, the red cord that comes out of Rahab's window uh, represents the blood of Christ shed for us. Or the crossing of the Jordan River represents Christian baptism. Or Canaan land represents heaven. And one can go on with such examples. So the text itself doesn't matter, it's just these sort of connections that, that we make. Now some of these might have, have, for example, the blood on the doorposts at the uh, Passover, and the red cord in the window, and the blood of Christ, there may well be a connection. I'm not saying that there isn't. But um, there is an impulse to, to find ways of, of explaining what's going on. A second approach has been called typological or figural. The uh, early church father Origen, born in 185, was the first to write a full commentary on the book of Joshua. He writes, citing Hebrews 8, verse 5, and Ephesians 6, verse 12, that Joshua's wars are, quote, a shadow and type of heavenly things, namely, the fight of Jesus against the devil and his angels. Well, in Greek, Joshua and Jesus have the same name. Uh, so, whenever uh, Origen refers to Joshua, he calls him Jesus. At least uh, in the English translation, it's translated as Jesus. So Jesus' uh, fight against the devil and his angels and, quote, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. This is perfectly biblical. It follows Paul and Ephesians. And since the believers are not promised, quote, kingdoms of earth, but kingdoms, kingdoms of heaven, therefore, he continues, we shall not fight in the same manner as the ancients fought. We shall not fight in the same manner as the ancients fought, nor against the same kind of enemy. 
For origin, the battle is internalized, teaching us, quote, to trample on the demon of avarice, boasting, and arrogance. So to express the hope that this is possible through the cross of Christ, Origen draws from Joshua's exhortation in Joshua 10.25, and he writes, If we understand these things spiritually and manage wars of this type spiritually, then we shall be able at last to receive from Jesus as a share of the inheritance even those places and kingdoms that are the kingdoms of heaven bestowed by our Lord Jesus uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his final homily on Joshua 10, he transforms the wars of that chapter into a wish, even a prayer. Quote, Would that the Lord might thus cast out and extinguish all former evils from the souls who believe in him. But the figural approach, this typological approach, can also run counter to the text. In Hebrews 4, verse 8, the author contrasts the rest offered by Joshua, where in Joshua 11:23 we read the land had rest from war. In Hebrews, we find uh, a rather different take on, on uh, rest, in which he says if Joshua could have, would have, let me get it correct, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak later about another day. So then a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. Of course, he also draws on Psalm 95, which also sees the rest of Joshua as incomplete. And yet five or six times in the book of Joshua, the uh, narrator states quite clearly that they had rest. So we have the allegorical approach, the figural or typological approach. Thirdly, we have the moral exemplary approach. Take Rahab, for example. By the way, the authors of the book of Hebrews and the book of James take this approach to Rahab as a character. James maintains in chapter 2, verse 25, that Rahab was justified because she treated the spies hospitably. Hebrews puts Rahab into the line of exemplary faithful ones in Hebrews 11. The early church fathers take up similar readings of the Rahab story. Rahab is seen by the church fathers as exemplary in her mercy and her repentance. And so for some today, Rahab still represents the ideal convert. Well, there are some, however, who think that she represents um, somehow a, an a capacity to see through the oppressive political system of the Canaanite city-states. She becomes a collaborator against her own people and sides with the Israelites who were fueled by faith in Yahweh's liberation movement. So all of these approaches are similar in that they see in Rahab a paradigmatic character. No doubt a good observation since her story comes first in the book and must mean something significant because of that. Now a fourth approach I will call a literal analogical reading. <clears throat> the problem with some readings is that they, they themselves fuel violence and injustice. The Puritans in the 17th century <clears throat> and the revolutionary preachers of the 18th affirmed that the American people and their experience were analogous to Joshua's conquest of Canaan's indigenous people and of God's favor on Israel. John Wesley, in his sermon, A Caution Against Bigotry, wrote, uh, said this, in which he criticized the American colonists. Quote, even in cruelty and bloodshed, how little have the Christians come behind them? 
and not the Spaniards or the Portuguese alone butchering thousands in South America, not the Dutch only in the East Indies, uh, East Indies or the French in North America, following the Spaniards step by step. Our own countrymen, too, have wantoned in blood and exterminated whole nations, plainly proving thereby what spirit it is that dwells and works in the children of disobedience. Not that many listen to Wesley. Similar situation in Latin America as Wesley already indicated, John Wesley. The story of the conquest of Canaan is the most often used biblical foundation for the conquest of Latin America. A prominent and influential Spanish philosopher of the 16th century, Sepulveda, used this biblical theme to legitimate war against its inhabitants. He justified the conquest in order to punish blasphemy, and he argued that the continent was a special donation by God as a promised land, and that God chose the Spanish to carry out this divine judgment against the infidels and to conquer their lands. Even relatively recently, white South African rhetoric has included citation of the biblical story. Paul Kruger, president of the Transvaal Republic on December 16, 1989, quote, when we think of the former emigrants, the foretrekkers of yore, it is then revealed unto us how God, in his divine providence, dealt with them, even as he dealt with the Israelite nation of old. He summoned them to the same task. Canaan was inhabited by heathen alienated from God. Israel was bidden make it the Lord's dwelling place. In the American context, consider the Declaration of Independence, in which Thomas Jefferson wrote, about the Native American. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. The fact is, as Thomas King writes in his recent and very fine book, The Inconvenient Indian, Wholesale annihilation of villages and populations was much more common among Europeans. He tells this story. Prior to an attack on a Pecot village at Mystic River, Puritan preachers assured the soldiers that, quote, you need not question your authority, your authority to execute those whom God, the righteous judge of all the world, hath condemned for blasphemy blaspheming his sacred majesty and murdering his servants. This, prior to an extermination of an entire village of some four to five hundred inhabitants, mostly women, children, and the elderly. The commander of the American forces there came upon this village after its warriors had departed for some reason. He, the commander, stated, quote, God was pleased to smite our enemies and to give us their land for an inheritance. See how the book of Joshua can be used in these ways it has been used? I doubt that, that it will help to pick any of these historic ways of reading the stories of Joshua, nor is our challenge simply to determine how to juxtapose violent texts over against peace texts. As a child, I learned early that there was no need to justify the conquest accounts in the book of Joshua. After all, if Jesus could say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, then surely we might also say, you have heard how Israel killed the Canaanites at God's command, but we say, with Jesus, love them. Moreover, Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. See, even as a child, I learned to re-script the story of divinely sanctioned violence, and to do so in the key of the Gospel of Matthew. And so from there, it wasn't that difficult to mine the book of Joshua for our favorite verses and to forget the rest. 
And so in some respects, my presentation is a confession. I was raised in and continue to be associated with the Mennonite Brethren, a denomination that identifies itself as Anabaptist and Evangelical. I didn't own toy guns as a child. I was not even allowed to point my finger in a shooting gesture without hearing from my mother. Still rings in my ears. We don't shoot people. And that's it. That's all she said. We don't shoot people. Yet I still often hear, we are a biblical people. When I was young, I also used to hear the German expression in my church, and this one also rings in my ears. Es steht geschrieben. Still have a bit of a hard time with that. I used to say it better when I was five. Uh, it stands written. It is written. Well, how does one adjudicate among texts that stand written? Christian Smith, in his book, The Bible Made Impossible, shows how biblical interpretation that assumes that everything has to be figured out uh, has generated 34 or 35 books with the title Three Views Of, or Four Views Of, or Five Views Of. Five Views of the Atonement, Four Views on War and Peace, uh, Four Views on the Lord's Supper, Four Views on Baptism. Why these kinds of books? Because we have a, a kind of a modern need to get it right, uh, to figure things out. What I think we need as Anabaptist and evangelical readers of Joshua is an honest engagement with the text of Joshua along with a nuanced understanding of what sometimes people call the thickness of the biblical canon. By that they don't mean the thickness of it this way, but the thickness of it in, in a different way, kind of the, the, the complexity of it. You go in one level and you discover a whole new world, like those old computer games, where you, you, you win, you, 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 you master one level and it takes you into another level and it gets more complicated. And you master that level and it takes you even deeper. Well, there are two things I think uh, we need, we need to, to address here uh, in order to address this thickness of the Bible. One is we have to be honest about the biblical context in its ancient world. And secondly, we have to be honest about the character of Scripture itself. Let me illustrate briefly. Could it be possible that the biblical writers were actually limited in their understanding of God? They, as much as we, are able only to offer approximations based on available language, vocabulary, and literary genres. Consider these two examples. In the 9th century BC, there's a king named Misha in Moab. Moab is east of the Jordan River. Where is east here? I have no idea. Uh, so uh, Moab is situated east of the Jordan River. In the ninth century, he uh, engages a, a battle with Israel. The king with whom he engages battle is Ahab. And he uh, gets his scribes to uh, make a stela. And on that stela, well, I could have showed you a picture of it too, it's about this tall. It's a massive piece of rock, about this wide. And on that stela, this is one small bit of it, he wrote, I killed all the people of the city as a sacrifice for Chemosh. Chemosh is the god of Moab, the main god, and for Moab, and Chemosh said to me, go take Nebo from Israel. And I went in the night and I fought against it from the daybreak until midday. And I took it and I killed the whole population, 7,000 male subjects and aliens, and female subjects, aliens, and servant girls. For I had put it to the ban, Herem, for Ashtar Chemosh. Chemosh drove him, that is the king of Israel, away before my face. And another example from the Bible, 
in Judges 11, Jephthah, the man who's famous for offering uh, to uh, sacrifice his daughter, he's in a, um, a conversation with the Ammonites, uh, Ammonites from also east of the Jordan River. Uh, and these Ammonites want to um, uh, recover some of the territory that Israel is, uh, has taken. Uh, and so Jephthah is responding to their request that Israel should give back some of the land of the Ammonites. So the Lord, the, so Jephthah says, then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel occupied all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. They occupied all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan, which happens to be where Ammon is situated. So now the Lord, the God of Israel, has conquered the Amorites for the benefit of his people Israel. Do you intend to take their place? Should you not possess what your God, Chemosh, gives you to possess? And should we not be the ones to possess everything that the Lord, our God, has conquered for our benefit? So notice the similarities between Misha and Jephthah. They both believe, well, first of all, the Misha inscription. Chemosh, the Moabite god, is angry with his land. Chemosh commands, Misha obeys. Misha killed, well, I didn't show you the whole text, but earlier on in the text, it says that Chemosh was angry at his land, and he gave the land into the hands of the king of Israel. Now, in this scene that I uh, quoted here, uh, Misha, uh, Chemosh, the god, commands, Misha obeys. Misha kills the entire population. They're devoted to destruction as a sacrificial, uh, sacrificial act for Chemosh. The holy objects are taken to Chemosh. Chemosh is depicted as an active agent in warfare. Uh, and there is an integral relationship that exists between people, God, and land. So what we're dealing with here are what could be called generic conventions of uh, ancient conquest accounts. The biblical conquest account in the book of Joshua shares some of these very same uh, assumptions. The text from Deuteronomy and Joshua that I had on the screen earlier, they share these same literary and theological conventions. The gods take an active role in battle. The gods use cosmic agents like sun, moon, stars, meteors. And there are uh, Near Eastern texts that describe such. Uh, they also encourage, uh, with oracles, encouraging courage, no fear. Uh, they have hyperbolic figurative expressions. Uh, we killed everybody, not one left alive. The conquest is perceived as a judgment of the gods. The destruction of all the people is common. They depict the enemy similarly as a common threat, and they stress retrib retributive justice. So here's one, uh, one <coughs> problem. If the Bible writers use the same language and even theological vocabulary and theological interpretation for what's happening in the warfare, um, what do we make of that? Uh, how do we understand what the biblical writers are saying? Uh, we could say perhaps that uh, well, Misha didn't actually hear Chemosh say, go take Nebo from Israel. Uh, Misha invented that. He only thought that Chemosh told him to go take Nebo from Israel. Well, if you apply the same logic to the biblical text, you might say, well, uh, Joshua only thought he heard God say, go take Jericho. Uh, kill all the people, and so on. So I'm not happy with either picking Nebo's, uh, Misha's side or Joshua's side. They're, what they're doing is using the same vocabulary, the same language, the same genre, the same kind of uh, way of articulating uh, what they are experiencing or what they had experienced in the past. And so I'm much more comfortable uh, thinking that the biblical writers are, are simply using the language that's available to them. 
to say something that they don't have any other words to describe. Of course, what they want to say is Yahweh is sovereign. Yahweh is active in our life, in our history, in our story. But see, Misha wants to say the same thing about Chemosh. And so it, it, it's complex to say, well, Joshua was right, Misha was wrong. I would rather say both were using the same language. Now let me, let me uh, uh, change the, the topic. I'm convinced that uh, theological reflection on scripture, if it's done for the church, must be done with some construal of what we mean by scripture in the first place. René Girard says that the Bible is a process underway, a text in travail. It is not a chronologically progressive process, but a struggle that advances and retreats. The Bible reveals writers who wrestle with, who struggle with, who try to come to terms with what God is doing. And the Bible, because of that, is also a conversation within itself. The Bible is, in some cases, also an argument within itself. And I think that's the only way to understand how the Bible Come to terms, comes to term, terms with warfare. Now David Kelsey in 1975 wrote a book called The Uses of Scripture in Recent Theology. And he said this, part of what it means to call uh, a, set of, a text or a set of texts authoritative scripture is to ascribe to it some kind of wholeness or unity when it is used as authority. In other words, not the text as such, or not any individual texts, not even the book of Joshua, not the text uh, as such, but the text as construed as a certain kind of whole is appealed to. The wholeness that is ascribed to scripture is a function of the singularity of the end to which the uses of these writings is said to be sufficient. It's a dense statement, but I think it's an important one. That is, to put it, I think, simply and over simply, what you get out of the Bible is largely determined by what your end goal is. That is, what you, what you expect to get. Well, does that mean that we all can find whatever we want? Well, let me explain what he, what he suggests. He says that in the actual practice of doing theology, every theologian, and every person, for that matter, every person who takes not just vaguely scripture, but more particularly the biblical canon as his or her authority, must decide just how one's use of one part of the canon is to be interrelated with his use of other parts of the canon. So for the book of Joshua, I have to decide not just how I'm going to read the book of Joshua, but how the book of Joshua belongs to the whole. How it contributes to the whole and how the whole interacts with the part. Kelsey offers this delightful parable, with, with, which you may have heard before, in which a group of boys, uh, and he says they're boys, uh, we can change it to children nowadays, gather to play a game in an empty lot. One of them says, come on, let's play ball. Now, if you were an observer, you would note that whatever they do with the ball, their decision about which game to play will involve construing the ball and other things on the field in one way or another. The construals 
will depend on which sort of activity they take to have been invoked by the cry, let's play ball. Right? So when they hear, let's play ball, they will have to decide what kind of game they're playing. The decision about which game to play will determine, among other things, what the point is of the specific things done with and to the ball, by what rules it is done, and so what it means to score. Now this, I take it, is what is always and has always been done in biblical interpretation. I believe that our work in theological reflection, to cite Kelsey again, is concerned with what the task or point is of doing theology in the first place. Kelsey suggests, in addition, that theologians, or I would say all of us, our reasons for taking biblical texts as authoritative always, and here I quote, always derive their force from a logically prior imaginative judgment. Either about, and he, he gives us some suggestions, about, let's say, the mode of God's presence. How is God present? Or about what it is to be a Christian. So, or to put it in another way, what is studied in exegesis, he says, depends on a prior decision about how to construe and use the text. Those of us who attend professional society meetings of the Society of Biblical Literature or the Canadian Society of Biblical Studies have opportunities to attend hundreds of lectures and papers presented. And one can go to uh, any one uh, session out of hundreds being offered and discover that presenters construe the Bible in altogether different ways. One will take a completely historical, non-theological approach. Uh, one might, you know, uh, depending on which room you go to, uh, the people gather in that room because they want to hear about that particular construal of Scripture. Why do people come to your congregation, or to the Mennonite Church, or to the Baptist Church, or to the Roman Catholic Church? Well, because they were born in it, perhaps. But also because there is a construal, not only of Scripture, but of what's the point of doing this whole thing anyway? So, in other words, there's no biblical text. Uh, there, there's not even any particular depiction of God as a character in the biblical text that, that uh, by itself comprehends what God is about and what God is up to. Or to borrow a phrase from Paul Hansen, there is no biblical text or no biblical depiction of God that can fully comprehend the trajectory of God's purpose. This means that there's much that is embryonic in Scripture. That's why I like René Girard's text in Travail, because Travail is a birthing term. Uh, there's much that's embryonic in Scripture, as Christian Smith puts it. Much that may well be understood as needing to grow into a more fully developed, set of insights and implications. But Girard says it's not linear. It's not like we can project a kind of a evolutionary development uh, uh, simplistically. What's required, suggests Smith, is a letting go of the idea that the Bible is a collection of complete and final teachings on every subject imaginable. Now, what if we were to construe the Bible the way Kenton Sparks does? And he suggests that all of Scripture points us in the direction of the missio dei, the direction of the mission of God. And what is the mission of God? To redeem all of creation. Okay, that's a, in a nutshell, construal of Scripture. All of Scripture points to the missio dei, the mission of God, which is to redeem the whole created order. Let me conclude by saying, by offering three, two very short illustrations 
of how New Testament writers do just that. In Matthew's genealogy, he includes Rahab Tamar, the wife of Bathsheba, uh, uh, the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, uh, Tamar, and Ruth. All four are Gentile outsiders. Each of them is in some way or other marginalized and perhaps even somewhat uh, disreputable. Jesus is born into a line that repeatedly crossed or transgressed the boundaries stipulated in Deuteronomy about not marrying foreign women. That's very clear. Because marrying foreign women will lead you into worshiping, worshiping the gods. And you can see that in Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 20. But Matthew makes a clear point that Jesus was born into a family line that transgressed the boundaries of Deuteronomy's laws. Yet Jesus in Matthew says, what about the law? I have not come to abolish the law. Matthew himself is wrestling with what this might all mean. Of course, Matthew ends with the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. There's much more to be said of how Matthew plays with the notion of the Gentiles and the nations. You find it all over in Matthew's Gospel, including the very first story in Matthew about the Magi, foreigners who come and prostrate themselves, bowing down before this baby king. The first in Matthew's Gospel of quite a few other people who also bow down before him. Ironic, isn't it, that Gentile should do so right at the very start of Matthew. That's why Rahab's story in uh, J Joshua is also a kind of paradigmatic story. She's the first, and she's a Gentile, and a Canaanite who should have been killed. How about Paul in Romans? Of course, he wrestles with this question of Jew and Gentile, and how Gentiles are incorporated into the family of God, Romans 9 to 11. But at the end of the book, he writes in chapter 15, welcome one another, just as Jesus Christ has welcomed you, Chapter 15, verse 7. This, he says, is a confirmation of, quote, the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. This is a far cry from show them no mercy of Deuteronomy 7. So scripture testifies to a struggle, to an interpretive struggle, as it points to a resolution in the love of God. As Jesus put it in Luke 6, but love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you, you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Surely the mercy of God, as described in the Bible, trumps the genocide of God. Shall I affirm, one, the mercy of God, and call the other to the bar of justice? Yes, like Abraham, who said, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Like Job, I shall, because I believe that that's the most biblical of all responses. But, of course, I do understand that every reading and every interpretation and every construal of scripture and every writing of a biblical text is simply an analogy that gets things right in a particular but limited way. Even our writing of scripture gets things right in a particular but limited way. 
Thank you for your attention.